Hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, snowy and chilly Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm Christine Mishanek. I'm the Director of International Relations for the University of Michigan College of Engineering, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today. First, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, your video and microphones will remain muted throughout the session. Closed captioning is available. Please click on the CC button located at the bottom of your Zoom screen to turn the transcription off or on. This webinar will include two presentations followed by a moderated question and answer session. Questions submitted in advance will be addressed first. After pre-submitted questions, we will open the chat box for you to submit additional questions. Uh, we will not identify those who have submitted questions, and unfortunately, we will not be able to get through every question during this brief webinar. Next, I have the pleasure to briefly introduce our moderator and speakers. First, we are joined by Professor Eric Michelson, who received his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from the Katholieke Universiteit Leuven, Belgium, and a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. He currently serves as the Associate Dean of Research for the University of Michigan's College of Engineering. His primary research interests include computational electromagnetics, and particularly fast wave and Maxwell equation solvers. Our, one of our speakers is Professor Chris Ruff, who received a BA degree in physics from Reed College and a PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Michigan. He is currently the Frederick Batman, Bar excuse me, Bartman Collegiate Professor of Climate and Space Science at the University of Michigan. Professor Ruff's interests include remote sensing methods, atmospheric, oceanographic and terrestrial applications and sensor technology development. He is also currently the principal investigator of the NASA Cyclone Global Navigation Satellite System, or Cygnus, mission. Finally, our first speaker, Professor Tulia Polkinen, received her PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Helsinki in Finland. She is currently the professor and chair of the Department of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering at the University of Michigan. Professor Polkinen's research interests focus on the plasma physics of the Sun-Earth system, including numerical simulation and development of methods that help improve space weather forecasts. With those brief introductions, Professor Paul Cannon, we welcome you to begin your remarks. Thank you for the introductory remarks and thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you about the some exciting space weather uh, science that we're doing at the uh, University of Michigan. The sun is a vast energy source powered by the uh, nuclear reaction that happens at its inner core. That energy bubbles to the solar surface that you see in red here shown in this, in this video. And those uh, bursts that you see as bright brightenings on the solar surface also expand to the solar atmosphere that is shown in green uh, surrounding the sun and from the solar atmosphere to the outer interplanetary space all the way uh, to the Earth orbit and beyond. Here you see another view of those uh, vast bubbles that are the basics of the space storms and, and the uh, creators of the space storms that happen at Earth. Now the sun is the small white circle at the center of the image, and you can see a wider portion of the solar upper atmosphere as the uh, clouds expand to outer space. You can also see uh, the grainy structure that hits the camera that is on board a satellite near Earth orbit. Those uh, disturbances are caused by uh, highly energetic particles that leave the solar surface uh, at the creation of the flare and reach the Earth orbit in only about 20 minutes or so. The, and this is what creates, uh, when those particles hit the uh, telescope, 
taking the images uh, on the satellite, they create the grainy structure uh, disturbing the image. You can also see the cloud itself uh, leaving the solar surface. And it takes the cloud uh, a few days to reach the Earth. So there are two different time scales of uh, space storms. One is the very high energy particles that leave uh, in association with the solar flares. Those reach the Earth in about 20 minutes. And then uh, the much larger uh, cloud that expands to outer space that takes a few days to reach the Earth. And understanding those and their impacts to the uh, Earth and its space environment is what is at the heart of uh, space weather. When those highly energetic particles uh, come from the sun, uh, they also reach the Earth's uh, environment and increase the radiation in, in space and also in the upper atmosphere. As you can see in this map uh, depicting the radiation at 40,000 feet altitude, this effect is most significant at high latitudes. If you're on an air flight, uh, for instance, uh, from my home, home country, Finland to Chicago, you can actually, during a space storm, you can get an, a radiation dose that is equivalent to about 10% of the annual dose from natural sources. While this might not uh, sound bad for an individual um, passenger who travels only occasionally, it is significant enough that airline crews have to be monitored for their radiation doses. Again, as these particles uh, reach the Earth in, within tens of minutes of their creation at the solar surface, it's important to try to predict the, uh, these effects so that we could take protective measures for the airline passengers and especially their crews. To that effect, we've studied the solar images and the solar flares that you see uh, a large flare brightening here on the solar surface and tried to develop um, machine learning methods to uh, predict the conditions that lead to the formation of the flare. And on the right, you can see here one uh, example of such predictions. The yellow curve here shows uh, the probability of a major flare occurring within the um, next hours. And as you can see here, uh, here is the time of the flare observation. The probability of flare occurrence using our methods goes up significantly already 20 hours before uh, the actual flare observation. This indicates that we uh, have the ability to predict the flares already 20 hours in advance. And just think how significant this would be as you could uh, reroute uh, flights to go on lower latitude routes or take other protective measures to, to shield and, and protect uh, sensitive satellite instruments to, from the uh, radiation effects that I showed you in the solar image at the start of the presentation. As the cloud, larger cloud reaches the Earth in a couple of days, uh, this, uh, the interaction of the cloud with the Earth's magnetic field and near the space environment creates uh, a high electron density content in the upper atmosphere above 100 kilometers altitude. These electrons uh, are hazardous in, in a sense that they uh, disturb and distort the signals that, that come from uh, navigation and communication satellites to our receivers, such as uh, your mobile phone that is tracking, uh, tracking you and guiding your, your way to, to um, wherever you might be going. And so navigation errors that typically are in the order of meters or even centimeters uh, now can increase to tens of meters, which if you think of self-driving cars is clearly poses a problem for many of the applications that we might, might use. And so again, uh, it is uh, important to try to learn to, to um, monitor and predict these uh, electrons in the upper atmosphere. 
Fortunately, uh, the errors that they produce in the uh, that the electrons produce in the signals can also be used to monitor the uh, electron environment in space, and that is what what you see on the right hand side image here. You can see the electron content uh, in in color coded uh, units in in millions of electrons in a in a volume, and so you can monitor with a good uh, network of ob observations, you can monitor the um, current conditions in the upper atmosphere. However, that leaves you no time to react and, and uh, inform the users of navigation and communication um, devices and applications to, to react to the increased hazard to, to uh, increased errors. And again, we have uh, employed machine learning methods that currently produce us one hour forecasts that you see on the left image here. And as you, if you compare the two images, they are very similar. And so uh, this is uh, very promising that we can now provide our users at least one hour advance warning that uh, they might be expecting errors in their navigation and communication signals. And we're currently working to expand that time span even further so that we could get the, to the 24 hour um, prediction level. Those electrons also carry currents that have effects on the, on the Earth's surface. And uh, one of the most significant effects are the uh, additional currents that are induced into uh, electric power networks. And here I'm showing uh, voltages that are induced in the US power network uh, if a major solar storm hits. And you can see that especially the higher latitude networks are most vulnerable, but also the East Coast very dense and, and uh, highly connected networks are uh, at risk during uh, solar storms. The US with its uh, vastly connected network is particularly hazardous uh, in, this, in this case, because problems in one area of the network propagate to the next one as the networks are all connected. And again, uh, we run our physics-based simulations that allow us to predict those uh, uh, disturbances on ground. Here I'm just showing one example with observation in black and uh, model result in red, showing very uh, good agreement and thereby very good prediction of the, uh, of the uh, possible defects in the, and disturbances in the power system system that might uh, arise. And currently uh, the models run in real time so that we can predict uh, these disturbances one hour in advance. And again, um, with machine learning methods, we hope to increase the lead time to about 24 hours. Just uh, to uh, end here, I'm showing our uh, University of Michigan Space Weather Modeling Framework uh, view of the Earth's magnetic field as the solar wind and solar disturbances rattle it. You can see the highly uh, variable um, magnetic field that is the cause of the space weather disturbances that we see on ground. This provides, uh, this runs operationally at the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center and provides one hour predictions of the space environment and uh, also ground disturbances at any given time 24 seven. With the machine learning methods that I briefly described, we hope to increase these warnings up to 24 hours to protect aviation, space assets, power systems and any infrastructure in space and on ground, and also to estimate the uh, positioning and navigation and communication errors that space weather might um, cause. And with that, I'll turn it back to Eric Mikielsen. Thank you, Tuya, for this uh, very informative presentation. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we'll, we all learned, learned a lot about space weather events and how uh, energetic particles that come all the way from the sun can impact uh, society and life on Earth here in general. Uh, 
So I think I'm now going to invite Chris Ruff to our virtual Zoom stage. Uh, Chris will talk about weather events that we're perhaps a bit more familiar with, uh, earthly weather and, and weather conditions here on Earth. It's of course a topic that, that's in the news all the time. And, uh, and, and I look forward to learning more about the latest research on the topic. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, yeah, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of the background of how we forecast um, hurricanes or tropical cyclones, and then um, a little bit about some of the work we're doing here at the University of Michigan to uh, help improve our forecast capabilities. So um, I'll start with this, uh, um, chart, which is generated by the National Hurricane Center. They do this routinely to estimate the quality of their forecast. And this is a, a chart that shows how good their hurricane track forecast is. Uh, track is where the eye of the hurricane is. And so this is a forecast of where the eye is going to be at some point in the future. Uh, the red line is where it will be 24 hours in the future. And the green is 48 hours and three days, four days, and so on. And you can see that um, over the last um, you know, 30 years, uh, the quality of the forecast, uh, the track forecast has steadily improved over time. And um, for example, um, our one day forecast had about a 100 nautical mile error. This is a, a one standard deviation error back in 1990. And it's uh, less than half of that now, about um, 30, 30 nautical miles, um, well, in 2018. Um, so that's a significant improvement in our ability to forecast, you know, where the storm's going to be in the future, and in particular, where it will make, uh, where and when it will make landfall. Um, and uh, the reason why um, we are doing so much better has to do with, you know, what steers a hurricane, what causes a hurricane to go in the direction that it's going to go. And the, the primary uh, features of the Earth system that steer a hurricane are the in background environmental fields surrounding the storm, not what's in the storm, but what surrounds it in, in you know, the hundreds of kilometers area uh, near the storm. Things like the temperature of the ocean, the background wind field that pushes the storm, the background air pressure field that forces the winds. And um, it's fortuitous that the sorts of things that steer a storm also in general are the sorts of things that are relatively easy to measure from space. And that's because they don't change that quickly. They change on time scales of days. They don't change that quickly horizontally. It takes you know tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers for there to be a significant change in, in these variables. And um, also in general, they don't occur under very heavy precipitation. And these are all limiting things that make it easier to measure from space because um, space measurements or remote sensing measurements have a hard time penetrating through heavy rain. They have a hard time resolving very fine horizontal features. And just because of the cost of satellites, they have a hard time measuring things frequently because the way the orbits work, they'll come back around the same spot on the Earth every day or two. Um, so uh, we've been able to measure storms better, or the background fields around storms. And then you take that information, put it into a numerical forecast model, and it does a better job of predicting the, uh, the direction of the storm or the track of the storm. If you look at a similar sort of plot for the forecasting of the intensity, the intensity of a storm is the maximum sustained wind in the storm, which is you know related to the Cat One, Cat Two, Cat Three thing for you know storm intensity. Um, these are the similar sort of plots for the one standard deviation error and the in the um, maximum sustained wind forecast one, two, or three days into the future. And in this case, you can see. Um, that there actually hasn't been that much improvement um, over the last 30 years in the forecasting of intensity. Um, we haven't, we're not that much better now than we were 30 years ago at forecasting how strong a, a storm will be at some point in the future. One exception to that is this region right in here in the early 2010s where there was a significant improvement. And a lot of that improvement can actually be ascribed specifically to uh, a major infrastructure investment that the U.S. government made to the National Hurricane Center um, shortly after Hurricane Sandy um, made, um, caused a lot of destruction in uh, the uh, you know, metropolitan New York and northern New Jersey area. And that, um, that resulted in a significant investment in uh, new computer capacity um, at the Hurricane Center. Um, but overall, there's been much less improvement in forecasting hurricane uh, intensity than there has in track. And the reason for that has to do with, um, you know, what it is that causes a hurricane to grow or shrink, you know, what intensifies a hurricane. 
And, you know, to see what makes a hurricane grow or if it's going to grow or when it's going to grow, you have to look at the, the mechanism that causes hurricanes to happen in the first place. And there's this sort of fundamental positive feedback mechanism that happens in the core of a hurricane, which causes it to grow. Um, it starts with, well, it's a cycle, so you can start anywhere, but starting at one point um, with the surface winds that are blowing in the middle of the storm, the winds enhance the evaporation of the water into the air. So the windier it is, the more evaporation there is. The evaporated water or the water vapor carries a huge amount of latent heat with it when it, when it uh, changes from liquid to gas. And when that water vapor condenses back out into clouds and then rain, that latent heat is released into the atmosphere, a sensible heat, and it warms the atmosphere and causes um, wind. And that wind causes more evaporation. And that's positive feedback mechanism that can run away and, and, and cause intensification. So in order to be able to predict that mechanism, you need to measure some part of this cycle. And one part in particular that we focused on trying to measure is the surface winds in the middle of the hurricane. Um, if you can measure those accurately, you can predict the latent heat flux going up into the atmosphere, which is the energy source for the hurricane. Uh, the problem with doing that is there's several problems. One is the time scale of changes of, of wind speed in the middle of a hurricane are very short on the time scale of hours. So you need to measure them on time scales of hours. They change very quickly horizontally, especially if you're right near the eye wall of the hurricane, or if, if you move just a few tens of kilometers, there's a huge change in wind speed. And also, almost always in the middle of a hurricane, it's raining really, really hard because, as, a, as a consequence of this, um, of this positive feedback loop. And in general, her, um, satellites have a very hard time penetrating through heavy rain to be able to measure what's going on underneath them. So all three of these things kind of conspire together to make it very difficult to make the measurements needed to improve uh, hurricane intensity forecast. So here at the University of Michigan, We've addressed this by developing a new um, satellite system called Cygnus, or the Cyclone Global Navigation Satellite System, that was specifically designed to address and improve upon these limiting factors that make it difficult to hur uh, forecast a hurricane. We want to be able to measure more often, and the way to do that is to have lots of satellites. We want to be able to measure with high resolution, and the way to do that is to use a specific new type of remote sensing that uh, allows you to have high horizontal resolution. And thirdly, we need to be able to penetrate through heavy rain. And the way to do that is to make measurements at very long wavelengths or very low um, frequencies so that there's not that much interaction with the raindrops and you can see the surface. And all of those um, you know, requirements were kind of bundled together into this new mission. And these are, uh, this is a picture of um, a couple of the, or three of the, her of the satellites in the Cygnus constellation. It's a constellation of eight satellites um, the reason we could afford eight is because the remote sensing technique it uses is uh, very cost effective and allowed us to be able to basically build a lot of satellites for the same the same cost as uh, or actually less than a typical single satellite. And um, this video here walks through the way the system works or the remote sensing technique that's used that enabled all these capabilities. Each Cygnus satellite has a modified commercial GPS receiver on it. And the GPS receiver is modified so that it measures GPS signals after they scatter off the Earth's surface. And this video shows pictures of the scattering centers, these little blue dots are where the GPS signals scatter. When the signals enter into the antenna beam that's looking down at the Earth, we can measure the scattered signal coming back up off the ocean. And the navigation signals in the GPS um, signal get distorted by the roughness of the surface of the ocean. And by measuring the distortion in the navigation signal, we can calculate the roughness of the surface. And the roughening of ocean surfaces in general is forced by the local wind. So by looking at the roughness, we can infer what the wind speed is over the ocean. Um, and because GPS operates at a very long wavelength so that it can work in rain, we have no problem penetrating through the heavy rain in a tropical cyclone. Um, because the system uses commercial GPS receivers, they're very, very low cost compared to a typical um, scientific um, satellite. And that allowed us to be able to build a lot of them for the same cost. And that's why we can make measurements very frequently. Um, and my, my final slide is just an example of some measurements made by Cygnus. Um, this is a, a couple of years ago, 2019, uh, Hurricane Dorian overpasses. These are overpass, um, overpasses made about every 12 hours. This is measurements. Uh, this is a one hour series of all the satellite measurements made from the whole constellation over one hour. You can see the storm right there. Um, these are the wind speeds at the surface that are measured by Cygnus. 
And then um, this on the right is a composite of three hours of data composited together. And when you composite data over three hours, because storms are changing so quickly, you need to re-register all the data to account for the forward motion of the storm. And in this one hour image, you can see the winds are a little bit smeared out because of um, if the data are not re-registered. And then on the right, we re-register all the data over three hours, and then you can really see the storm structure, especially in this bottom right one here. You can see this very heavy rain, and, or rather wind in the middle. And then as you move out away from the inner core out to the, to the outer, outer edges of the storm, the wind speeds get weaker and weaker, as you'd expect. So what we're doing now is taking these wind speed measurements and assimilating them into um, a modified version of the hurricane forecast model, the numerical model that's used by the National Hurricane Center, and then um, studying the impact on the forecast skill. And, and we're seeing that the, uh, that the forecast skill for intensity and also for track are improved by using these winds as we had hoped. Um, so we're in the process now, it's kind of a beta test of making, um, making sure this works well. Um, it's not operational yet with the National Hurricane Center, but um, that's, our, that's our hope in the future that they'll start using this operationally. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over to um, Eric. Uh, great, Chris. Th thanks. Uh, great presentation. So uh, as uh, Christine announced earlier, we're now going to move on to some Q&A. Uh, and we're going to start with questions that we pre-selected from those submitted by uh, registrants prior to the event. Uh, that said, the, the live chat is open right now. And I invite everyone to, to submit questions via that channel as well. We're going to come to these questions shortly. All right. So. Um, Chris and Tuya, um, the first question I'll ask uh, appear to be a recurring theme when I scan through all the previously submitted questions. Uh, many registrants observed that uh, significant space storms and, and, and also high intensity tropical cyclones uh, in a specific location uh, seem to still have a very low uh, uh, probability in a given year, right? But, but that said, they cause uh, potentially catastrophic damage. And, and so many folks were interested in hearing your opinion um, on topics like, like grid hardening, uh, building resilient and, and, and redundant infrastructure, things like that. And, and so uh, generally speaking, folks are interested in learning how we should think about the cost of, of prevention versus the cost of dealing with the aftermath of an event. Um, Tuya, you want to take it first? Sure. Um, fundamentally, that is not a question uh, for scientists. Uh, that is a political question, of course. But um, I think you're very right in, in saying that uh, solar storms are relatively rare uh, to start out with. They vary on a 10-year time scale. And, and so uh, they're more frequent every 11 years, and, and then they are less frequent uh, when the sun is quieter. But typically, there are um, several uh, storms per month uh, that cause um, medium, medium hazards and medium uh, damages. If we talk about uh, very extreme solar storms, those might be sort of uh, once in a century type of events. Um, unfortunately, the last superstorm was about 150 years ago. And so we're increasing the probability that a major, major effect, a major uh, solar storm is gonna hit the Earth's way. Uh, that said, um, the cost for rebuilding the entire infrastructure to, to shield against these solar storms is probably prohibitively expensive. But there are many things that you can do at lower cost if you understand how the storms operate and how, uh, how the impacts uh, propagate and distribute in the, in the uh, near Earth space environment and, and in the Earth's surface. For example, if you talk about the power networks, uh, one easy um, way not to get rid of the damage but limit the ex extent of the damage is to develop networks that can be uh, separated from one another. And so, so you can, uh, even if one part of the network goes down, it does not expand to cover the entire nation. Similarly, um, 
there are there are other ways that that you can protect space assets from the worst hazards and so on and and at least limit those hazards so um i would say that we still need one of the challenges in in uh predicting the effects and impacts of the, these very extreme events is that we don't have, fortunately, we don't have very many examples to study. And so we have to rely on numerical uh, simulations and models that are outside our ability to compare them with, with reality and so to know how realistic they are. So I think there's still research to be done to assess what the maximum disturbances could be, what they could do, and then take protective measures to the extent that we can. Mm -hmm. Great. Chris, uh, what's, your, what, what's your take on, on building re uh, resilient infrastructure and, and the cost of, of, of prevention uh, versus uh, dealing with the aftermath of, of an event? Right, well, I think there's two types of loss in a, uh, related to hurricane landfalls. One is loss in property and the other is uh, loss of life. So loss of property, I think it's more straightforward. Um, well, there's a more straightforward trade that you have to make um, between prevention and the cost of aftermath and re you know, rebuilding versus building better in the first place. Um, you know, the, the um, prevention of loss of property, uh, there's clear things that can be done to prevent loss of property or mitigate it with uh, landfalling hurricanes, like um, building codes for you know the maximum winds that a building can survive um, in, or exclusion zones where you don't build near the, the shoreline, or setbacks where houses have to be or buildings have to be a certain distance from the beach. And those sorts of things are all kind of uh, local or state or municipal regulations. And some states have much stricter regulations than others about exactly this sort of thing. So it's a choice that you make, um, whether you want to have big, beautiful mansions right on the beach or whether you want to set them back and um, have more um, you know, prevention that way. That's a choice that you know, individual um, communities make. Um, in terms of uh, um, loss of life, I think there's, you know, there's prevent, there is no, I don't think there's a legitimate cost of aftermath. If somebody dies, they die. So if some building is destroyed, you can rebuild it. But in terms of loss of life, I think the right way to link it is um, in terms of prevention, not cost of aftermath. And the way to prevent um, loss of life with hurricanes is to improve forecast skill, right? Well, there's two things. You want to improve the forecast skill, maybe make it further out into the future, um, so that they have people have more of a chance to evacuate and so on. But I think more importantly than that is improving the reliability of the forecast, the forecast skill itself, so that just psychologically people trust the um, the forecast more. And when there's a landfalling event or a major you know major disaster predicted in your community, you have a high confidence that it's actually going to happen. Um, you know, they happen, you know, hurricane landfalls happen more often than, than, you know, solar storm destructions of our power grid, but, but they don't happen often enough that people, um, people are okay with ignoring forecasts and staying put if they don't have high confidence that the forecast is correct. So I think for prevention of loss of life, the right way to thing to focus on is improving forecast skill and reliability for, for public confidence. Great, and this is, is actually a perfect segue in, in, into the second question that I, that I was going to ask. And again, it's a recurring theme amongst all the previously submitted questions. And so this one relates to data collection and analysis. And it, it's a topic that, that you both spoke about during your presentations. So this big data uh, revolution is, is upon us and uh, improvements in how we compute against that data uh, are leading to an enhanced capability uh, to predicting intensity and location of, of space weather and, and tropical storms, right? So uh, what tools and computational capabilities do you see on the horizon? And how far out uh, do you think that we someday may be able to predict these events? And this speaks directly to the issue that you were raising, uh, Chris, right? If we can increase people's confidence in these tools, then uh, they will uh, perhaps listen better when we ask them to evacuate and things like that. But yeah, how far out do you think we will be able to reliably uh, predict these events one day? Right, well, um, I 
I think practically speaking, we're not going to be able to go that much further out than we can now, maybe five to seven days, just because of chaos theory about what it takes to predict how the weather's going to change, especially with something this, you know, nonlinear with this runaway positive feedback mechanism in the middle of it. Um, uh, so predicting hurricane track and intensity more than five to seven days out is, I think that's uh, not likely to be significantly improved by, you know, an order of magnitude better computing capability and measurements because of chaos theory. But what we can improve with better computers, better models, better measurements is the skill of the three to five day forecast. And if we can get those way down, you know, the error bars on track and intensity forecast three to five days out so that people really trust a five day forecast. And when they're told that the hurricane's gonna make landfall in their community, everyone believes it and evacuates or does, does the appropriate you know, reaction. I think that's the right place to focus. Um, in terms of, you know, what makes better computing capability, um, just like to make one comment about, that I think there's this pretty sort of healthy competition that's been going on for many years between the forecast, uh, weather forecast skill in the United States and in Europe. Um, and uh, I just generally think competition is a good thing, but anyway, it's there. And um, uh, for the most part, in most cases, um, the Euro European forecasts are, are, have more skill in, in many different ways of measuring it. And I think one of the important reasons for that is, um, you know, I showed that one case where um, there was this big infusion of funds from the federal government to the National Hurricane Center shortly after Hurricane Sandy, and there was a significant improvement in forecast, and it's still there because they've just got bigger, better supercomputers than they did the day before Sandy. Um, so, you know, better computers matter. But I think something, um, if you look at the, the funding lines for the money invested in the European community into their forecast, the, you know, the ECMWF forecast um, compared to the US, there isn't a gigantic difference in the amount of money invested. What there is a big difference in is the reliability of the money. The Europeans are much better at having a plan, a 10 year plan, sticking to it, so that the people managing the, the forecast systems, the people that you know run those systems and decide which new you know, supercomputers to buy next year or next decade, they can plan in a really effective and efficient way. In the United States, it's a lot more tied to things like turnover from one administration to the next in the White House, or just the way funding decisions are made in Washington, they're, they're less steady. And even with the same amount of money, if it's going up and down and up and down over the decades, it's much harder to spend the money wisely. And I think that as much as anything, that's just, that's something that could be, um, yeah, that could have a significant impact on the quality of the U.S. forecast. Great, Tuya, uh, your take on this question: How far uh, in, in advance will we be able to predict these uh, space weather storms? That's an interesting question, and it um, basically is uh, comes back to two two different issues. One is how far ahead can we predict solar activity? At the moment, uh, we are taking very, very first steps to predict uh, solar activity uh, 24 hours in advance. And if you remember the two time scales, uh, it takes uh, energetic particles only tens of minutes uh, to reach the Earth, whereas uh, the clouds, the, the, the giant bubbles that leave the uh, solar atmosphere take a couple of days to, to uh, come to the Earth. And so if we can get 24 hour um, advanced warnings uh, or predictions of the solar activity, then we can increase our lead time uh, to, to those two timescales. But the challenge really is uh, with the clouds is that we see them as they leave the solar surface, but then we lose track of them because we don't have monitors on the way. And then we re-detect them when they are very close to the earth. That only gives us about an hour of lead time when the uh, storm or the cloud hits a satellite that is uh, upstream of the, of the earth uh, on the, and uh, detects the, the cloud coming. And that basically limits uh, our physics-based models to uh, when they see that the data, data shows that the storm is coming, then we can give an hour's prediction uh, that it takes for the, the cloud to reach, uh, the, reach the Earth from the satellite orbit. 
And so uh, there are two things that you can do to advance those. One is that you can, uh, with better computing resources, better models, you can try to model the entire sequence from the solar surface to the Earth. That is still in its infancy at the moment. And, and there are, but there are some promising trends that we might be able to um, develop those models uh, further. And that would of course give a couple of days uh, lead time based on the solar, solar observations. The other thing would be to increase it from one hour to maybe three or four hours would be to have uh, satellites a little bit further from the earth that would detect uh, the incoming solar wind and as the bubble reaches the uh, Earth's orbit. But basically, um, I think that uh, we need better observations. Observational infrastructure is, is very important. We need um, monitoring of the system, even if it doesn't give prediction it gives us better understanding of the state of the system and thereby its future evolution. And with these, we can uh, enhance, enhance the, the prediction accuracy, which I fully agree with Chris, is that uh, the lead time, if the, if the predictions are not accurate, the lead time actually isn't all that important. Uh, so you first need to get the accuracy right, then, then you start increasing the lead time. But then there is this whole um, other vastly uh, and rapidly developing area of machine learning and, and other uh, artificial intelligence techniques that allow us to uh, do uh, not physics-based predictions, but statistics-based predictions of the future state of the system. And those have been uh, proven to, to be very helpful in getting um, us from the sort of one hour time scale to, to uh, maybe 20 hour time scales. And so I expect those methods to still develop further and, and become much more useful to increase the accuracy. Great, thank you. So I think at this point, I want to transition from questions that were submitted prior to uh, the webinar to uh, questions that are being submitted live right now. So thanks everyone for uh, submitting questions through the chat. Uh, here's one. Uh, uh, and, and again, it, it seems to be covering uh, both sides of the same coin and, and it relates to the impact of uh, human activities on, on weather phenomena. So uh, perhaps starting with Tuya, uh, this person asks, do actions like mining and manufacturing, where large amounts of metal and minerals are redistributed, do they affect the Earth's motion, its magnetic field, and then uh, the uh, sun-Earth dynamics? And, and then if I can follow up uh, for, for Chris, perhaps, uh, uh, is there any evidence of uh, human activity being uh, attributable to changes in storm intensity and frequency? And I guess the answer there is yes. But Tuya, yeah, yeah you, you go first. Uh, yes, the, the mining activity, uh, of course, uh, some of the material in the Earth's crust is magnetic. And so the mining activity does create uh, local, locally uh, magnetic disturbances if you dig out um, material that, that uh, then has this uh, remnant magnetism. However, the large scale magnetic field that extends all the way out to space uh, is generated much deeper in the Earth's liquid core. And that field is highly organized into a dipolar shape that you saw so in my last slide uh, surrounding the Earth. And it is only that field that extends to far enough altitude to, to influence the space weather, whereas the uh, remnant magnetic permanent magnetism that is in the, in the rock and, and minerals and materials uh, on the Earth's surface those magnetic fields are very disorganized and they typically uh, do not extend all the way to space. So the answer, I would say that uh, human activity on, on space weather on that front is, is rather small. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you think of uh, something like nuclear bombs, uh, if you detonate those in the atmosphere, they create a lot of radiation that expands all the way to space and they can, those particles and that radiation can uh, stay in Earth orbit for um, years and even decades. Right. Mm -hmm. Chris? 
Uh, yeah, so it's interesting that one little comment that you made, which I hear a lot about, you know, whether uh, tropical, tropical cyclone, you know, intensity and frequency are increasing because of um, human activity. So human activity is warming the oceans and warming the atmosphere. That's clear. Um, whether or not that, it, and it, it seems like um, just at first blush that therefore there should be stronger hurricanes and they should happen more often. But it's actually not well proven out by a lot of, there's been a lot of work on this and there are some results that show that it does and others that show that it stays about the same and it's very inconclusive right now. So it's not at all clear that hurricanes are getting stronger or that they're more, more of them. Um, that's an open research topic that, you know, that has no clear consensus. There are maybe three other ways in which global warming is influencing hurricanes and the impact of hurricanes on people. Um, two of them are, there's very clear consensus on, and one of them is probably the case. Um, so one of them is um, because the oceans are warming, the sea level, sea level is rising. That's clear. I mean, you can measure the sea level rising. It's like, you know, 3.8 millimeters per year has been going on for decades and, uh, and it's accelerating um, because warm water expands and also because warmth melts ice and that adds more water to the system. And so there's, so sea levels rising and that causes a lot more flooding or potential for flooding when hurricanes make landfall. And that's very clear in, in the data and in the models. Um, and uh, actually just in general, flooding is um, the biggest source of damage in hurricane, when hurricane landfalls, much more so than, than the high winds anyway. So there will be more flooding because of sea level rise. Another direct consequence of warm, a warmer system is that more water can get evaporated and more water can be supported in the atmosphere. Um, and that makes for more rain. So just in general, there's a lot more rain, so just the water cycle's accelerating. There's more water getting evaporated and then it precipitates back out again. So hurricanes have associated with them more intense rain and just larger volumes of, of liquid water coming down in the storms. And that also enhances flooding and landfall, okay? So those two things are very clear consequences of human activity. The third one, which probably is true, but that's still, it's not as clear. And that is um, the um, acceleration time of the rapid intensification phase because of the warmth. It looks like the time during which a hurricane transitions from you know a cat one to a cat four, when it suddenly there's this little period of time it's typically 24 hours, 36 hours. It looks like that time, and the models say that time's going to go down, and some of the data suggests that it goes down. So the rapid intensification phase happens faster. That positive feedback mechanism has a has, is less damped. If, you know, if you want to think of it as a controls problem, and um, that makes it harder to forecast. Um, so that's a challenge for us. Thanks. Uh, here's just one that just came in. It's very interesting. So. Uh, this person asks, it's, it's, it's clear that something needs to be done about climate change happening all around us. And what would you recommend that the average person uh, who may not have the pull necessary to make, to make a huge shift, what can the average person do to help? Uh, and, and okay, it's even states, states that this is a question coming from a concerned high school student living in a uh, heavily agricultural community. Who wants to take this one? Eat less meat. <laughs> that that that'll help the that'll help the uh you know just sort of the energy output of the human race significantly. I think that's pretty clear. Um, I actually I've only driven electric cars a few times, but they're really fun. <laughs> so I think there's a real upside to transitioning from uh, gas gas and diesel powered cars to electric cars for for the environment. They're also just fun to drive. But I think that in the future, so a high school yeah high school student probably hasn't bought their first car yet, right? So um, you know, in 20 years, you may not be able to buy a gas powered car, but in the next five or 10 years, you still will be able to, but yeah, think about getting an electric car. Great. Um, here's another uh, interesting one. So, so far, most predictions uh, of course have been made using physics based codes, right? Uh, codes that make use of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, computational fluid, fluid dynamics, paradigms and so on. But now increasingly we're shifting towards statistics based predictions, machine learning and things like that. So how do you see that play out? Will uh, machine learning and, 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 and statistics-based methodologies 
uh, beat uh, physics-based uh, codes and, and, and do away with them? Or, or, and will they allow for predictions that uh, uh, go out further into the future? How do you see all, all that play out? And how uh, do statistics-based codes, uh, how, they will, uh, how will they be helped by sensor net, net networks and the like that are present, uh, that are omnipresent uh, in, in, in our society? Want to take that one, Julia? Okay, sure. Um, well, I don't think it's an either or question. I think it's it's uh, both. Both we need both types of models. One of the challenges in uh, statistics-based models is that they're great if you have large amounts of data. Most often, we don't have large amounts of data when it comes to extreme events, which are the most important and interesting ones to, to uh, model and, and know what the consequences are. But if we, the, you can't teach the, the machine learning network to, to, to produce you a prediction for an event that hasn't happened or that has happened only once. And so uh, while the statistics-based models can help us uh, increase the accuracy and lead time of more typical, be that space weather or ground weather or whatever system you're trying to predict, uh, they will never be uh, very good at uh, predicting the extreme events. There, I think we need to uh, do the physical modeling and, um, and uh, experiment with different parameters, with different processes, uh, what the, what the worst, worst case scenarios might be. But both of those fundamentally lie, uh, rely on our ability to, to have high quality observations of the environment. And, and so um, neither is very useful if we don't take care of the um, monitoring infrastructure that we have of the environment. Great. Right, and if I could add just a little that, maybe this is something a little bit more um, relevant to Earth weather prediction than solar weather prediction. Um, yeah, in addition to um, extreme events being difficult to predict because we don't have big populations of training data, you know, statistically. Another thing that uh, even when you have a lot of data, which you often do with you know, earth science observations to train you know, machine learning or other statistical um, um, algorithm, prediction algorithms. Um, they, it's, they, do, they don't do as good a job, I think, of um, extrapolating. They're very good at figuring out or predicting what's gonna happen within the body of the domain of the training data. So that if there's a trend away from the training data, the statistical prediction algorithms will tend to predict things that are consistent with the training data and they will push you back towards the mean value of the training data, not the trend. So for example, global warming, we're gonna train this data with all these conditions that happened yesterday and over the last 10 years, but the next 10 years are gonna be warmer. And the predictions that are based strictly on statistical tuning to past behavior will under predict tend to underpredict the effects of the warming that hasn't happened yet. So they're not as good at, I think, at extrapolation outside of the training domain as physically based um, predictors in general. Yep, great. Um, I'm going through the chat here. So uh, yeah, here's an interesting one, a, a very engineering centric one, I think. Um, so we've been discussing improvements in forecasting capabilities. So this person asks, what implications do changes in forecasting have on, on emergency response engineers? Well, with, with hurricanes, I mean, like we are starting to work with, there's, there's groups at like the, uh, at, the uh, at FEMA, you know, the emergency response part of the US government. There are, there's parts of that organization that are, responsible for reaching out to new potential data sources that can help them, you know, and see whether or not they might want to use it operationally. So those are people we're talking to now with, with Cygnus because we can make measurements of, um, well, in addition to the winds, we can make measurements of flooding after landfall. The same GPS reflections are really good at tracking exactly where the floods are and aren't. And, and we get frequent revisits. So we get these quickly refreshed maps of flooding after landfall. 
And uh, so there's the potential to get that data into their hands to help with you know, disaster management. Um, well, for, in, in like near real time for actual disaster management. And then in kind of post reanalysis, using that improved information to help train and validate flood forecast models for the future. And both of those activities are happening. So yeah, there's a d direct connection to disaster management. And, and likewise, uh, Tuya, uh, for space weather, do, are the folks in the in the telecom industry, for example, directly uh, tied into the observations that um, uh, that are made uh, via satellites when it comes to space weather? And likely, and, and likewise, the, the folks uh, who are operating our power network, do they track uh, the, the, the data carefully? Certainly, they do. And the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center uh, puts out regular warnings and and uh, predictions of of the environment. The FEMA actually uh, made a study published in 2019 that identified two uh, particular uh, hazards that have a nationwide impact for the US. One was pandemic and the other one was a uh, extreme solar storm. And so we certainly know that um, pandemic conditions are no fun. And I just hope that we're not getting the solar storm on top of this. But um, so, so yes, uh, these scenarios are important to build and, and uh, the nation is actually right now taking, taking space weather and, and its potential impacts very seriously. And so uh, simply because of the magnitude of the hazards that might be if an extreme event, event did take place. And I think it will lead to, to, uh, to uh, first of all, uh, devising strategies, what to do if a major storm happens, but also devising strategies for the infrastructures to, to be built in, in a more res resilient way. Great. Um, and I think we're running out of time, so this will be our last question. And it, it's a follow on to uh, uh, Chris's comment about European forecast models being more accurate due to consistent funding. So really the big question here is, uh, what can we do in this country to uh, secure more funding uh, for this field? Uh, do we uh, ask government to fund more of this work or could we also in parallel, for, for example, uh, tap uh, uh, in, uh, the insurance industry, uh, where there are plenty of folks there who are very, very concerned about the risk and especially uh, coastal exposure. Could we ask those folks to, to uh, uh, help us out funding uh, uh, research in this field? Yeah, I don't know about that second option. Maybe that's possible. I mean, it's not that easy to move private money into a federal agency. It doesn't usually work that way. Um, I mean, maybe it could, but um, yeah, it doesn't usually work that way. The system isn't set up that way. I, maybe so that um, private entities can't influence government decisions. I'm not sure why, but that, that rarely happens. But I guess that's a possibility. Um, the other thing, what we can do to help, you know, move things along, I think the simplest thing is to vote for people who believe in science. Correct. Right. And one, one, one thing that I think is happening at the moment is that um, the space industry is becoming much more private and uh, making private uh, companies being interested in making space measurements will improve our um, possibilities to monitor both the space weather aspects, but also the uh, earth weather aspects of, of uh, the environment. And so, so I think that in, in that sense, the private money will actually help uh, to, to protect our environment. Great, thank you. I think we're just about out of time here. I want to thank everyone for submitting these great questions through, uh, uh, through the chat. Unfortunately, we were not able to get through all of them, but I think we covered uh, a, a very nice subset. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think at this point, I'm going to turn, turn it over to Christine again. Thank you. And thank you, Eric. And, and I would just like to echo that appreciation and say thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, Chris Ruff and Talia Polkinen, as well as our moderator, Eric Mickelson. And most importantly, thank you to our audience and sticking with us through this entire hour. We really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for this great session. Take care and go blue. <laughs>